All right. Um, I love the last panel. I was all about uh, sustainable food. Now we'll talk about sustainable energy. And uh, we have some really, uh, I think, experts in the field on the stage today. And it's a real pleasure to, to be up here moderating. Um, quickly on my background, uh, I run a sustainable investment fund. And we have a, roughly a half a billion uh, invested in entrepreneurs that are trying to make the world a better place. Um, and the energy vertical is a very, very important space for us. Um, and uh, there are lots of fantastic entrepreneurs building businesses there that will hopefully both be commercially successful and have a major impact. Um, and I think uh, for those that were here for the earlier panels, uh, I think it was two panels ago, uh, there was a gentleman up here who said this could be one of the most exciting spaces to be in, sustainable investing, uh, as we try to create a new, new future. Um, so, um, with that, uh, maybe we should allow the other panelists to introduce themselves. And Henry, you're to my left, so why don't you, you go first? Hello, everyone. My name is Henry Ormus. I'm a nuclear engineer by education. Last 14 years I've been working and living and studying in Sweden, US, uh, Finland, Russia. So, fully nuclear. And um, I've been here now back to Estonia six months. And uh, we want to build the uh, Estonian sustainable future with Fermi Energy. We uh, want to implement uh, small modular reactors est in Estonia because uh, we are convinced that uh, without nuclear, uh, carbon neutrality in Estonia is impossible. Yeah. Good. Ines? Yes, hi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ines, Ines Ilese. I am a head of analytics at ST Energy, and I am a... Um, management board member at subsidiary in Latvia, SIA Enefit. And lately I have been working with the sustainability projects, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm here. Great. And then Rasmus. Great. I'm Rasmus. I'm a deep tech, clean tech guy, uh, innovation lead in Sunly. Uh, so Sunly is a renewable energy startup. We do solar, wind, and storage. Uh, on top of that, we also invest 10% of all capital we raise into electrification startups. So I do that. So I'm here to uh, say that what's possible now in renewables, what's possible in the near future, and what's possible with the startups that we actually invest in. All right, so let's start with the title of the panel. Um, what does a sustainable future, energy future, mean to you folks? So I have a, I have a feeling based on the fact that you mentioned nuclear in the introduction, <laughs> that's going to be part of it, but, but fire away. OK, well, obviously, sustainable energy future we need to have a lot of clean energy. We need to get rid of all the fossil fuels. This means huge decarbonization, uh, a lot of electrification. And we have not many options. We have wind, solar, hydro in Estonia we don't have, and then nuclear. These are pre pretty much the options. Maybe a little bit of uh, bioenergy, but of course, we don't want to burn the wood in our oven. You know, We would like to use it more wisely, maybe in construction or to add more value for that. So that's from my point. Yeah. Um, to me, it is uh, diversified production from various sources. And I would say that actually I would be a very strong supporter because uh, we will either need some um, fossil fuel or we would need some other fuels so that we can go away from the uh, uh, polluting generation. So um, I'm here representing ST Energy. They are actually investing a lot on decentralized, uh, decentralized production um, and also helping the clients. So from their side, they are actually investing a lot in production from wind and solar and helping the clients to do the same. Yeah, so for me, the future of sustainable energy is wind plus solar plus storage. And then, because those things, at least the first two, definitely exist, storage is getting there with the commercial terms, and then bringing it down to the consumer level, where it, is, it can be uh, on a decentralized level where everyone can uh, play a role. So it doesn't have to be these massive, massive companies uh, that, are, that are building you know, centralized energy systems, but it can be on a granular community-based level as well. Uh, in, in, in a sense, giving back the you know, keys to the community because energy is such a key underlying part of what we do on a daily basis. Now, when I walked over to the conference today, I almost was blown over 
by the, uh, the wind, okay? <laughs> and so uh, it was obvious to me there's a lot of wind power here. Um, but you guys put out all sorts of different types, you know, uh, nuclear, solar, wind. Are we going to have it all? Or is, uh, are the Baltics going to go in one direction over another direction? Well, if I may, uh, I've been studying uh, electrical engineering, sustainable engineering, uh, sustainable technologies. And the more I've studied, I've understood that without nuclear in the mix, uh, it's impossible to really go. And with just solar and uh, wind, they are good, and we need to implement a lot, and uh, I'm a su big supporter on that. But uh, the volatility that it brings to the grid and the, 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 the problems that may arise uh, when during uh, long and cold winter days there's no wind, there's no solar, we need backup power. And what is this backup power? We cannot use gas for many reasons, you obviously know, and gas has a lot of CO2 in it. So, so we need to have this good balance mixed, uh, that's the only way to go. Yeah. I mean, I, I disagree on nuclear. Um, so I don't have a PhD <laughs> background, but I do have a background in carbon finance. Uh, and, and when I look at nuclear, then nuclear could be an option if it was, if it was anywhere near ready on, on, the, on the level that we're talking about now. Because I, I believe that for 340 days, you can cover everything in solar, wind, and the storage we have. You will have two weeks where you will need long-term storage. But for that, you can look at you know, amazing startups that are coming, coming from like Germany or Norway or Estonia that are like doing, for example, liquid air storage. I mean, that's as close as modular uh, nuclear or cost-effective nuclear is, maybe even closer. So, and if you can cover that two weeks, we're only talking about two weeks now, uh, then you can easily do solar, wind, and... Um, and storage the way it is now. Maybe, maybe I... We're going to get the nuclear rebuttal here, by yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah. maybe I'll respond that uh, the small modular reactors does not exist. And the technologies, for example, what we in Fermi Energia, we look at the BVRX300 uh, developed by General Electric Hitachi, uh, is going to be built first in Canada and will be ready 28. But the technology is proven technology, 90% what is used in that plant is already used in the plants in Finland, in Sweden. All this know-how is, is available. And we as Fermi Energia, we work with uh, our best uh, European partners. Vattenfall is our shareholders, owner of Swedish nuclear power plants. Uh, with, we work with uh, Fortum. They have a lot of capabilities. In, with, we work with uh, Tractable NG, uh, who owns the Belgium nuclear power plants. So the technology is there, and uh, I'm really I would say that actually the battery technology is much more far because to implement actually like long-term battery storage, it's immense cost and this will increase the, the actual price of electricity because you need to uh, pay for the investment. So, yeah. Any comeback? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't actually want to get to that level, but uh, paying for investment, uh, Battery storage is cheaper than nuclear. So sometimes it's like watching a tennis game and watch the ball go back and forth. This is and why you put me here, right? Yeah. <laughs> maybe, the maybe. Uh, You're the net. <laughs> and Sorry, I had to. <laughs> tennis game. <laughs> maybe just to add and the, to kind of, we are here in, uh, it's a, for investor, investors and startups. So it's in the end, it is always the investor who looks the business case. And we believe that we have very strong business case. We uh, plan to have the electricity cost 55 euros per megawatt. What are the prices now? 100, 200. And the power plants, uh, old nuclear power plants in, in Sweden and uh, Finland, they produce electricity with 20, 30 euros per megawatt. Today, I think the price was in some hours 600 megawatt euros per megawatt. So it is kind of assured that the nuclear in the long term, it is actually very, very cheap option. And, uh, yeah. All right, I'm gonna to switch the topic, yes. otherwise it's gonna <laughs> keep going. But um, I, I do have a, a question around capital availability, um, because obviously stock markets have kind of fallen. Uh, there is some concern uh, about the availability of venture money, um, et cetera. Uh, for a lot of your aspirations, uh, you need money. Are you worried it's not going to be there? 
Uh, no. Uh, and <laughs> that, that's the easy answer. Uh, so we have insane inflation. Historically speaking, energy has been a great inflation hedge. Uh, second, obviously, Sunday itself is doing wind and solar, which is proven. Uh, and the marginal cost of, the, of you know, solar wind is essentially zero, right, uh, once you get it up. Uh, and, um, and, the, and the actual startups that are coming now, uh, what they're doing is uh, fundamental shifts in, uh, in the technology that is available, right? Uh, but they're in a really early stage. So, so when we look at the capital crunch, the capital crunch is mostly affecting Series B and beyond. Uh, it's not that much in the pre-seed seed and Series A. Uh, so therefore, they, they will have government grants and three to four years, uh, so altogether, let's say six, before this will be affecting it. I really hope the capital crunch doesn't last for six years, because then we have you know, majority of other problems that will arise from that. Uh, but I don't see an issue, issue in, the, in the grand scheme of things. If that's, the, if that's the decision taken that we actually back up our words that sustainable energy is the, is the way forward. Inez, what do you, what do you think? Um, I say that uh, I don't see this coming um, simply because investors really love this um, from the perspective that it is sustainable investment and the institutional investors are getting more and more comfortable to invest even into EPC. Um, so this is why this is not something that I would see coming. Mm. You're going to need some money, Henry. We will need a lot of money, but uh, not so much. Uh, one uh, reactor, one billion. Two reactors, two billion. We want to build four. Uh, the money is available. That's not a problem. But the problem is that we need actually electricity. And we see, we've been analyzing the market, and we don't see investments coming into electricity market. And that's why the prices have actually ramped. They're the old power plants are shutting, been shut down, and nothing new is, uh, is coming. So actually, there's a lot of room in the market for all the clean energies, and uh, there is money waiting, uh, good business cases. And we are going to prove that we will have a solid business case. Are, are, are any of you? Uh, folks worried that we might backslide. Um, uh, you know, the war in the Ukraine is, is terrible, um, and it's made a lot of re governments rethink their energy strategies. Some may go for the, uh, the quick drug, the quick fix, and go back to some fossil fuels, as opposed to invest in your future. Anybody worried about that? I'm not. Um well, I'm representing nuclear here, so I'll, I'll talk about nuclear. Actually, nuclear energy is uh, one of the very good way to secure the uh, security of supply and the energy independence because the uranium, the fuel, what you need actually very small amounts, it is, can be produced by Canada, by Australia, by some African countries, by Kazakhstan. There's a lot of uh, diversity of supply for the fuel, so that is not a problem. Yeah. Okay, I go next. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm not, um, I'm a little bit worried because both of these are political, naturally, and um, maybe now we see clients uh, going and thinking more about securing their supplies of the energy. From that perspective, maybe there is a little bit of throwback, but overall, if you look at that, and if you look actually into what are the plans of how to go away from gas, then there is quite a big percentage to go into renewables. Uh, so I think maybe uh, this plays a little bit on your favor, right? Uh, but overall, I wouldn't say this is too much of a uh, throwback, more maybe accelerator from my point of view. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, you know, I hate to say this, but a good crisis is also a good opportunity for up and up and comings. I mean, we had COVID and digitalization, you know, jump 10 years in like a year and a half. Uh, now, when you're now looking at, the, oh, we don't have energy, we need to secure our supply. Obviously, yes, you will have a decision like, are we going to go back to the old reliable that apparently is 600 megawatts an hour today? Um, great news, I didn't actually know that. Uh, and, uh, or, or we're going to try something different. You know, you can't fix uh, old existing problems that we created a decade ago with like, uh, you know, old solutions. So I think it actually gives you a catalyst uh, uh, to change things and quite rapidly. Uh, that's what a crisis usually does. 
Yeah, yeah, fu fully agree. Like this is now a big opportunity for Europe, you know, to kind of untie the relationship and the dependence on the on the Russian gas and other fossil fuels that are imported. So and now we cannot import that. So we need to push heavy all the clean energies. So there will be stronger drive, and this is only positive. So yeah. Okay, I still get to have some fun up here though, <laughs> because you're doing this on the backs of the consumer, right? And so. The average consumer thinks when they hear spending on nuclear, spending on solar, wind, etc., that their energy bill is going to go up, not down. And they're paying a lot of money right now. Inflation is rising, right, for their energy needs. So how are you going to convince the consumer, this group out here, that it's time? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. It is true that energy prices do end up on the consumer's plate, right? Uh, well, I mean, the first argument is that the solar, like I said, once built zero marginal cost, right? Nothing at all. No other technology can say that. Wind is very similar to that. Uh, yes, you need to finance it right away. But when you look at solar, when you look at utility scale solar, you look at what Sunday does, uh, it's actually really cheap to build. Uh, I mean, in four years, we, uh, we are now at, what, over 200 megawatts? Uh, like like building it right before it took way way longer so, so it shows that there is a, that there is a way to roll it out really really quickly and that's the reason why we do solar not wind because of the because of the you know cost uh, question uh, so yeah but in the in the long run uh, or in not even the long run in the near term two three years these kind of decisions will lower the energy price uh, because the price that we have today is not because of what we did last year it's what we did a decade ago and how we didn't take the decisions then so yeah, but this is a difficult question. Mm. It is, but um, I think you are coming with good news, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, our goal is to produce electricity. It's 55 uh, euros per megawatt hour, and we want to have long-term uh, power purchase agreements with the uh, Estonian large consumers, but also why not with the small consumers? So this is a very good offering compared to what you see, and. Um, I'm a little bit opposing, like, I'm just like warning that to people that too much wind and solar in the system will actually increase the system cost because you need to invest uh, a lot to the grid, one thing. You need to have investments into backup power, which also cost, in the end, actually, the consumer will anyway pay all these investments in one way or another. It's, they're often hidden. But when we do investments and we do long-term agreements, then that's the cost. So at least 50% of power produced, we want to sell with long-term agreements, maybe rest to the market. Yeah. So we see that nuclear will bring the cost actually down. So it's a good, good balancer in the, in the system. Yeah, I'm, I have got a very similar opinion. I think in the long term, actually, it is um, good news. So it might be the case that there will be a little a bit of turbulence in the meantime, especially now with all the external factors, but uh, in the long term, and this is how I suggest to look into that, um, good things are coming. Um, I'm watching questions above your head that you don't see, um, and I'm going to ask a few of them now, and if anybody else in the room wants to raise their hand, feel free. But there's a lot of questions about hydrogen. Um, what should the Baltics be doing re regarding a hydrogen policy? Hydrogen policy, uh, can't comment on that, but hydrogen itself is very interesting. So I have a lot of startups that are working with that in, in this region, exactly for the, for the question of like, how do you do the two weeks? Um, so obviously fuel cell technology is a, a little bit more advanced than like a long-term storage, uh, but it can get there. Uh, and also in Sunday, we're looking into hydrogen as a, as a storage for, for wind itself. So it's, uh, so, it's, so it's definitely not off the table. Uh, because it's actually, it could be feasible in the next decade. Um, we would hope that it's quicker, but uh, probably not quicker. But yeah, it's definitely on the table. Okay. Um, me, I, um, I think it's too early stages, so this is why, I, personally, I don't believe in it yet. But I do believe there is a potential there. Mm. Yeah, in hydrogen, there is big potential, but... Uh, I see it more in the industry side because there's a lot of uh, hydrogen used, for example, steel industry. Now it's uh, based on natural gas. So this need to uh, switch to hydrogen. 
then also in the oil industry. Many industries, actually, the, the fertilizer industry needs hydrogen. But if we talk about energy sector, uh, I have a little bit bad news, but I don't believe in it because if we produce the hydrogen from the electricity, we store it, we liquefy it, and then we get back, we turn it back to electricity, the, the, the percent what we get out is maybe 30% efficiency. So it's basically like, I come to you with uh, four ice creams. Hey, can you please hold me? I'll come back later. I'll come back to you. C can I get my ice cream back now? You give me only one. Where's the others? Gone. So that's, that's the, the, the reality. And to have these hydrogen systems, it's huge, huge investments that need to be done. And these investments will be paid by the consumers. Maybe not directly. You don't see it in an electricity bill somehow. We probably need to have very heavy subsidies if we want to start building actually the hydrogen infrastructure and the economy. So hydrogen will be part of the future, but, uh, but let's see, uh, there's a very long way to go. The hype is now much bigger than the, the reality coming in, let's say, next decade. Yeah, uh, just as a follow-up on that, like, sure, CapEx is very high, high and the hype is immense. Mm. Like, it's like Web3 level. Uh, but the point is that, just your analogy, the four ice creams that come, uh, if they're produced by renewable energy, they're all free. So even if you get the one ice cream back, it's a free ice cream, uh, in that sense. <laughs> so, so it works out in the, uh, in, the, in the way you actually produce it. So just, just as, a, as a fun analogy there. But it's not By the way, if you gave me four ice creams, I'd eat them all. You wouldn't eat anything, <laughs> yes. just for the record. Yeah, of course, immediately. <laughs> yeah. But there is no such thing as free energy, and you have the investment cost. So actually, the energy has a cost. So yes, somebody will pay it in some way or another. Yeah. Questions, anyone? Fire away. Thank you. Uh, first of all, love this panel. I could watch these two go, uh, go <laughs> these two go back and forth for hours. Um, it was mentioned that uh, nuclear, uh, in order for us to start using nuclear uh, energy even more efficiently, we see some technology um, finalized around 2028. What about uh, solar storage, wind storage? Um, because we all know that uh, storing that energy is a huge challenge. Because you know so much uh, about things happening in the background, what do you think is the realistic timeline for that? To have a bulletproof technology for storage. OK, so I think there's two points to this question. Uh, one is that uh, storage already works. It's just too expensive, right? Like, it, technically speaking, it works. It's the same where, when we're using the 2028 for nuclear. I mean, I'm, I don't doubt that nuclear doesn't work as technology. Like, yeah, obviously it works. I mean, we have nuclear plants after all, right? 90% of it is. It's the cost. It's, it's the thing that one reactor costs a billion. So, so if, we're, if we're saying that we can put the storage we, we like to wind and solar, we can do it today. It just won't be an economically good decision. Uh, you're, you're better off not uh, storing it than selling it to the grid. Um, so, by, but by 2028, I mean, the way battery capex has increased, uh, like decreased uh, on an exponential level, uh, I might even say that by 2025, you will have commercially, uh, commercially lady large scale storage that actually works on a, on a way that is profitable. Uh, maybe yeah. we take a question, because I saw one more in the back. Okay. Yeah, I just want to comment, but yeah. okay. So maybe just to switch the story a little bit, what's the prediction from all of you? How far away is uh, fusion energy? And is that something to wait for? Uh, uh, yeah, no. Go first. <laughs> uh, I can comment that. Uh, I've been following also fusion technologies, and I watched the, the one of the professor, one of the lead professor of the ITER, ITER project in, in France. Uh, basically, it's always 50 years away, you know. And um, it has been so last 50 years. Uh, basically, to have the fusion plant, now they are having the first demonstration plant. If this will be successful, they need to have the first demo plant, maybe 30 years. And then if this is successful, then they can make actual commercial scale fusion reactor. This is end of the century, realistic. If there is not a breakthrough in the fusion uh, technology, maybe a laser fusion that I kind of believe it will be actually something better than the, the, the tokamak, which is the conventional, what is mostly developed in the world. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so I love cold fusion. I love fusion. Like, I think it has so much potential. And I read this news earlier this year, it was January, where it worked in a lab. But it worked in a, such a limited segment that uh, if it wasn't fusion, they wouldn't have said it worked. But because it was 50 years away, going for 50 years, then it was positive news. But I was very hyped because I'm a sci-fi guy. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, quick one in the back, because otherwise they're going to give me the hook. Hi. Uh, differences aside, do you see a scope for cooperation between both energy types? And in the long term, and in the short term, considering maybe it's a bad example, but if you take present-day Germany, where you have a lot of requirement for gas, but now they're kind of suffering, what would be a scope from a short-term perspective and from a long-term where both nuclear and renewable could work together? I mean, obviously, in the long term, it, it can work together. No one's saying that nuclear can't work with renewables. Uh, what, I, what I'm worried about is that uh, is that that's going to stop mid-term and near-term developments because you're doing something else that's going to come live 20 years down the line or with a 10-year delay. Uh, so, so, but yes, in the, in the long term, if you will play uh, uh, a game of like uh, SimCity and you will fast forward, yes, 100% they can work together uh, and, and work, uh, work in a way where they, where they create this uh, renewable energy system. Yes, 100%. Neil, yes, uh, uh, please. Okay. Um, I, would, I would agree. So in the long term, this is how I would see it. It's a part of lasagna. Just the question is, which is uh, which portions are taking? And yeah, they already work very well together. If we look at Sweden, they have 50% nuclear, 50% hydro. Super good mix together. Uh, in Finland, there's about 30% nuclear. Then they have a little bit hydro, a little bit wind. Uh, work very well together. So, but in the future. Uh, of course, more, when more intermittent renewables come, we need the storage. So the storage is the key, also nuclear needs, because you know, during the nighttime you have uh, less demand. So we need a great capacity of storage, and storage price needs to go down, but currently it's, n it's, it's still very expensive, and that's why we will not see uh, huge investments in, 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 uh, in, in storage. Um, one word answer, yes, no. Estonia is carbon neutral in 2050. Yes, with I nuclear. Have, I have to say yes. Yes. There you go. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.